In this section, we're going to talk about women who are making changes necessary to turn the home inside out in our everyday cities. To start the conversation off, we have to begin with Dolores Hayden. Dolores Hayden is a pioneer in understanding the interior life of women and how that impacts society as a whole. In her seminal article from 1979, she writes, what would a non-sexist city be like? Speculations on housing, urban design, and human work. This viewpoint was inspired by a book that she wrote called The Grand Domestic Revolution. Much like the revolutions of suburban developments during the time of the isolation of women post-war, we can also point to a number of women who are trying to change the interior segregation of labor for the past century. Dolores Hayden was perhaps one of the first people to say a non-sexist city is necessary for our collective future. While I myself called urban planning sexist in many capacities, she was already focusing on that back in the 60s and 70s. Like many of the women who have been lost to history before us, Dolores Hayden daylighted a group called the Material Feminists. The Material Feminists focused not only on the physical design of these dwellings, but also on the social structure that society was enacting upon them. Rather than isolating housework, they had ambitious goals of socialized housework and childcare that was meant to revolutionize the American home and create a greater level of community. In some ways, this was called utopian, but it was actually an incredibly pragmatic look at the ways in which our society was male-dominated and unsustainable in the long term. This little-known intellectual tradition was overlooked for decades. Despite the fact that the material feminist's political ideology actually led them to design physical places to enact their ideals. In essence, they created a cooperative, kitchenless houses daycare centers, and also public kitchens and community dining halls. They intrinsically understood the isolation of these places as being detrimental to society and especially women in particular. In an endorsement in the Washington Post, they say about Dolores Hayden's book, women's work is not done. The design of our place to live or the built environment still follows men's visions. For most women, the old household drudgeries have merely been replaced by new suburban drudgeries. We now have women architects, but few if any of them are addressing the issue of residential and community design that are still keeping women in their place. And that a century and a half ago led to what Dolores Hayden calls material feminism. It's not surprising to consider that this group of women was erased from history. And it's incredibly bold for Dolores Hayden to bring this into light. Changing housing is incredibly difficult, but the conversation itself must be started so that we can create things now that will impact the future. In her article, What Would a Non-Sexist City Look Like? Dolores Hayden says, women must transform the sexual division of domestic labor, the privatized economic basis of domestic work, and the spatial separation of homes and workplaces in the built environment if they are to be equal members of society. She also understood that this isolation, this private life being hidden from the public, was the way to keep women in their place. This is not only a design change, this is a fundamental change in our society as a whole. So what does this look like in practice? You might be familiar with the term co-housing, not necessarily a commune. Co-housing is an intentional community of private homes clustered around shared space. The term originated in Denmark in the late 1960s, whereby each attached or single-family home has traditional amenities such as a private kitchen. But shared spaces feature a common house, potentially a kitchen, a dining area, laundry, and recreational spaces. Shared outdoor space may include a parking lot, for an example, but also, of course, open space that's flexible for public life and gardens that can be shared by the community members. Neighbors also importantly share resources like tools and lawnmowers rather than each home having their own individual equipment. Once again, emphasizing the sustainability of this kind of system and that it doesn't necessarily need to be isolated to a condensed urban environment. Some co-housing can also be informal, not necessarily built to that purpose, but essentially co-created by the residents of that building. 
Many large houses have this opportunity because of the way that they were constructed and our modern day needs for smaller areas of living. Shared kitchens through these roommate interactions create a greater sense of cohesion for the people who live there. And as demand grows for things like co-housing, more construction that is new can be made to accommodate these needs. Another case study I'll cover is called Praxagora Shek, or Kitchen Square, a modern experiment in communal cooking. This originated as an art project by the architect Elin Strand Ruin. Inspired by the Assembly Women play, Elin decided to see if it would work to take a kitchen and put it in a public space. Beginning with a non-functional art object to spark a conversation, she eventually transitioned to a fully functional kitchen. While we understand food trucks and other outdoor cooking areas, we don't necessarily have shared cooking experiences with strangers on a daily basis. Alan is obsessed with this idea because the kitchen and communal cooking experience can have such a great impact on the social cohesion of a community. Cooking is an intimate activity. Cooking is also based in your cultural experience. When you come together to share labor, you're also sharing information. I have a recipe that I can share with you, and I can also explain why that's so important to me and my family of origin. When you share a recipe with me, I'm learning something new that I might not otherwise have known. This is especially important in immigrant communities where there are a variety of different people from different places. There may be barriers to language, but boiling water is pretty universally known. In this area in particular, Alan chose a neighborhood outside of Stockholm, which is known to be an immigrant enclave. In many of these cultures, women are still relegated to this kind of housework, that kind of private labor that doesn't allow them to be visible in society. Bringing their labor out into the open was able to open up conversations, not only with women like them, but also different members of the society that wouldn't see them work in the daylight. In a good public space, something like this is called triangulation. However, that is typically talked about as a coffee shop, a place to sit, places to see other people, and other kinds of typical public space activities. Bringing such a private activity into a public space is a bit of a shock value, but incredibly good for sparking conversations. In this construction, Alan also planned for the idea of communal childcare, much in the same way that you would see in, again, Chateau Hoyuk and a community of that size. While women and other people are talking and cooking and coordinating, the children are able to play on the structure on the outside. Children coming from different places interacting is incredibly important for the cohesion of society. When we experience differences of opinions or even differences of appearance, like in a good public space, then we have a greater level of shared understanding of our fellow human beings. And when we come together and create something as a group, we can see the results of our labor. You have a meal that was prepared, that everyone can share in, and that in and of itself can point to the accomplishments of the community in general, temporary as they may be. We often see this kind of activity in public spaces as a special event. A long dinner table along a street, for instance, where people can come together and share in this meal. The connections that you make at that time, however, are temporary. It's a special event that's exclusive and not something that you can regularly turn to to build those social bonds. If a kitchen were in fact placed in a public space permanently, what would that do to change the community? It's incredible to think that this has never actually happened before. And again, the Greco-Roman rulers at that time understood this concept well before now. I think it's safe to say that cooking itself can also be a rebellion. When women have the ability to take charge and put ownership over their labor and put it in the public sphere, they have the ability, therefore, to shape society in bold new ways. Ellen has held on to this idea and she has made her vision a reality. And I personally hope that other women also take up this charge.